Oh, nice. I'm going to use the chords. These lights never seem to go together. I don't want you to leave me hold my hand. Oh, won't you stay with me? Cause you love me. This ain't love, it's clear to see. But darling, stay with me. Why am I so slow? No, it's not a good look, it's in self-control. Deep down, I know this never works. But you can lay with me, so it doesn't hurt. Oh, won't you stay with me? Right, I think we'll just go ahead and get started, and people will filter in. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to the first like virtual format for the Reclaim Mental Health Conference. We are super excited to have you all here um, and just have this conference start. And we're super excited to have our amazing Jenny Wu here um, for our first keynote presentation. Uh, Jenny Wu is the founder and CEO of Mind Brain Parenting and Mind Brain Emotion. Um, she's a Harvard trained educator and a TEDx speaker who dedicates her research and her career to helping people realize their potentials from the classrooms to the boardrooms. And we are so excited to have her here for our first keynote. Um, for uh, attendees, we want to let y'all know what your sort of features are for this webinar. Um, you are able to use the chat function to talk to both panelists and attendees. Um, you can also use the Q&A function at any point throughout the presentation if you have questions that pop up that you would like Jenny to either answer. Um, and she'll either try to answer it during the presentation if it flows with her presentation or save it for the end and answer it at the end as well. Um, so please do feel free to use the uh, Q&A function. There's also a raise hand function if you wanted to speak or unmute yourself um, to ask the question. We likely won't be having y'all unmute during the presentation itself, but at the end of the presentation during the Q&A section, um, feel free to use the raise hand function and just um, ask questions directly. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Jenny um, for her amazing keynote presentation. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. It is such an honor to be here to serve as the keynote for the 2021 Reclaim Mental Health Conference. And, you know, really first, I want us to take a solid moment and I want to acknowledge and acknowledge just how difficult this past year has been for all of you. You've now gone through an entire year of remote learning. Some of you are now back on campus. Some of you are staying off campus and many of you are sitting right now in your childhood homes. It's just such a bittersweet view, right? And this has been a year of ups and downs. And you know what's worse? It's probably um, even harder, the fact that we've dealt with being stuck in between the ups and downs, right? That feeling of being in limbo, feeling of being stuck somewhere in between and just kind of waiting, right? And not knowing. Um, not knowing exactly what is going to happen as we've awaited the results of the presidential election this past year, immigration issues, the trial of George Floyd's death, not knowing when something is going to happen as we brace ourselves for yet another act of racial, dis racial discrimination and crime and not knowing how it's going to happen as we wonder how we will really revert back completely to the lives that we've had prior to the pandemic. And you know, studies after studies have found that we actually feel a lot worse when we're waiting for something, right? When there's an anticipation, uncertainty, and really lack of control involved. And that builds anxiety, right? Versus even just finding out something, right? Having that down, even if the news is not what we quite had hoped for. So 
I really, I want each of you to just take a deep breath and acknowledge yourself to yourself that you are a true warrior for having gone through all that has happened this year. And I also want us to recognize that if it's anything that we've learned during this pandemic, it is that we cannot take life for granted. Yes, we may be waking up to a gloomy day right now, um, another day of feeling isolated, lonely, and restricted, but at least we're waking up to another day, right? We are the lucky ones to have another day, and that makes us warriors and survivors. And during this pandemic, a lot of time to think, to reflect, and maybe to ruminate just a little bit too much, right? And one question that I hear a lot from students is what now? What should I do with my another day? What really makes me happy? And how can I be successful and do the things that make me happy? So today, I'm gonna to try to help you answer some of these questions, right? Um, they're incredibly important, but daunting questions, which honestly essentially comes down to your sense of purpose. What makes, me, what makes you feel fulfilled, right, from that core? And how do you achieve personal and professional success pursuing that? So I'm gonna share with you some of my personal stories on how I've found my purpose and how to stay resilient when things get tough. But, you know, you've made the investment of spending your Sunday, uh, Saturday hour here. So I want this keynote to be really about you. So we're going to be going on a purpose journey together by doing some exercises to help you gain clarity around who you are and what fulfills you. So if you can have like a notebook pen ready, or maybe if you're on your laptop, have a Word document ready when we're going to make the most out of your morning hour. Yeah? Okay. So as some of you know, I teach a course here at UCI called Emotional Intelligence for School and Job Success. And at the very beginning of the course, I ask students to identify three emotions they improve. So for yourself at this time, I'm not gonna ask three emotions, but I'd like you to think of one emotion that you've been experiencing lately that you really would like to improve upon. So let's take a minute just to come up, think about that emotion. And, you know, I love to see it and talk about it. So if you can type it into the chat, one emotion that you've been experiencing lately that you like to improve. And while you're doing this, I'm going to be sharing with you a slide on what some of my students have said. So feel free to think of that emotion for yourself and type it into the chat. Burnout, yes, anger, overwhelm, frustration. Oh, I hear you. Let me go ahead and share my screen because I'm gonna show you what other students have said. Um, anxious, loneliness, restlessness, um, feeling lost, depressed, a lot of loss and frustration I'm noticing. Um, somebody did say happiness. Yes, we could improve upon feeling happier, right? Feeling left behind, yeah. I, I, I have so many stories from students of feeling that way, feeling empty, that's going to address today, right? How can we feel the opposite of empty, which is fulfillment? Feeling absent, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate this. So you, so now I'm going to unveil, okay? Um, so you'll, you'll see a word cloud, and this word cloud is from a number of my students who took the emotional intelligence class. And these students um, span from freshmen all the way to fifth year. They cover about 30 plus majors um, across pretty much all schools on campus. Okay, you ready? All right. Okay. So in the word cloud, the bigger words are the ones that are commonly identified, right? So you start to see some themes. Sound familiar? Um, so pretty much all that you've typed in, I think many students share your similarities, right? Um, we feel a lot of stress, right? Whether it's financial, academic, social, family stress, um, a sense of emptiness, loneliness, right? And you know what's crazy? So, okay, 
So there is this huge study that have really looked you know, like at what age during what age of a lifespan during this lifespan do people feel the loneliest loneliest? And guess what? Do you know what the age is? So it turned out it's somewhere between 18 and 19 years old. Isn't that crazy? Like at this age, you feel lonelier than say a 65 year old. And isn't it crazy how we can be surrounded by our family, by our peers? maybe even living in the dorms, yet we feel so surrounded yet so lonely, right? So alone. And I know exactly how that feels like and what you mean by that. So we're gonna talk about it, okay? And of course, anxiety is another huge thing, right? Um, it's the fear of unknown. And you know, let me tell you, like this year has, the pandemic has really served up just playful of unknowns, right? And we were um, scared, anxious about these unknown because of the frequency and the duration of just continual experience of the unknowns, right? That gives us anxiety. And what that does is that it paralyzes us from recognizing and pursuing our purpose. And that makes us empty, right? So the first thing we need to do is how do we get unstuck, right? Unstuck of feeling lost, feeling absent, right? So we're gonna do an exercise first, okay? So the, uh, so I'll talk to you about the game that I created, but this is one of the card from it. Um, and it's how to get unstuck. So when we ruminate, right? Ruminate, a lot of people are like, self-reflection is good, but when does it become bad? Well, that's when it becomes bad, when you start to ruminate, um, which means that we go down this rabbit hole of thinking about something that has happened or will happen over and over again. Um, maybe we feel like by going through the cycle of thinking, things will become clear, right? We can process this information better. But honestly, when you are thinking about the same thing over and over and repetitively without getting any sense of closure or figuring, figuring out actionable ways to cope with what you're dealing with, then it can become incredibly damaging to not only your psychological well-being, but really it cuts into phys your physiological wellness, right? And so stress comes from within, you know? Stress is the mind, the body, and it's all connected, right? And that is the difference between self-reflection and rumination. One is healthy and the other one is not. And these are the thoughts that detract us from identifying and pursuing our purpose because we become overly focused on these noises of self-doubt, second guesses, and insecurities, whether it's coming from other people telling us that or it's what we tell ourselves in our self-talk. So how do we get out of it, right? So research has shown that um, when we're experiencing these negative emotions, we have a tendency to build this tunnel vision. Just really like we are so focused on our problems and our negative experiences because we're so immersed in it, right? We're reliving it, we're viscerally experiencing it that it's really, really hard to pull off ourselves out. And so the antidote takes two steps. One is you have to recognize what you're ruminating on, right? What are you dwelling on, right? Identify that, identify the situation. Then you're able to pull yourself out by zooming out of your sense of maybe self-pity, feeling like a victim or feeling helpless, right? So um, then we, we are going to focus on the positive emotions as the antidote to really motivate us to change, right, to take action, or just honestly, simply to accept our situation. And this is sort of like a coping mechanism. And every time you find yourself ruminating and thinking back to that thought, right, I'm not good enough, if only, you know, come up with this positive emotion to be able to, or positive experience to be able to um, distract you from going back into the rabbit hole. So we're gonna just take a minute. You've seen the prompt, I'll read it out loud, right? 
what's a memory or emotion that you have been dwelling on, right? What makes you feel empty? Why is it that you feel absent? Why is it that you feel left behind? And what makes you feel lonely, right? What is it that particular incident or the thought, the specific words that you say to yourself? So go ahead and write it down. You don't have to share it into the chat, but write it down in your notebook, and your, you know, Word document, or feel free to share it in the chat if you want to, but, um, you know, I respect your confidentiality. So, but go through this exercise and identify that. And while you're identifying that, I see that Daisy has a question. Um, yes, Daisy, this is being recorded. So you do have access to the recording um, after the event. So um, so thank you. Thank you for um, wanting to come back and listen to it again. Um, thank you. OK. All right. So now that you have come up with uh, sort of identify this dwelling such situation right what is the positive emotion that you can come up with um especially to think and refer upon when you revert back to this negative emotion what's something so for example left behind i mean maybe left behind in a particular situation and honestly that sometimes that's how i feel as well. And in my students, I've heard so many stories about how, for example, you were living with roommates and now you're at home, but then your old roommates got together and are living together. And you kind of feel like that your life have just, they, their lives have just carried on without you, right? Leaving behind. But think of a positive emotion or a positive experience, right? Maybe the summer, you get to really have the time to reconnect with your friends, or maybe you met some other new friends, right? So think of a way to diffuse that. Okay, so now let's see. The exercise that you've done now is really the heart of emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is understanding where your, mo your emotions come from um, and really use this data to generate insight. And emotional intelligence helps you to build a large repertoire of skill sets, tools, and strategies to productively manage your emotions and manage others' emotions. So emotion, the word emotion really comes from, derives from this French word meaning to stir up and the Latin word, which means to move. And really the purpose of emotion, even from evolution standpoint is to help us take action, right? And informs us of what is important to us. And so em emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize and understand these emotions in yourself and in others, and this ability to use this awareness to manage your behavior, your actions, and your relationship with others. And emotional intelligence is made up of four key competencies. Um, we have at the top, you see self-awareness, self-management. That is really what people call your personal dimension, which are your intrapersonal skills, right? Um, and then the social awareness, relationship management are what we call the social dimension, right? When we talk about social skills, right? Those are your interpersonal skills. And you really need all of these pieces to the puzzle in order to be successful because you have to be able to understand first, right? Precisely understand and label and articulate what you're experiencing, right? Or what other people are experiencing. So when we say, oh, can I read this person? I can't really read this person, you know? Or I don't know what I'm feeling. I'm just in a foul mood, right? That doesn't really help much, right? You have to actually precisely identify what is it that your emotion that you're experiencing and what is it trying to tell you? And then only then before you can actually determine the most productive, healthy, and effective course of action for yourself or the course of action to persuade someone, 
right, to influence someone. And that is where the leadership skills really comes in. So my point is garbage in, garbage out, right? Garbage me in means if you cannot understand what you're feeling or you don't want to think about it, then there's no way you can actually take the right action to do something because, you know, that data is not insight, right? Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I like talking to you face to face. Um, and, you know, like one common myth that I get a lot is well, you know, I don't want to, my emotions, like they get in the way of my mental toughness, right? That's one huge misconception I hear, right? When people think, you know, I need to be strong, I need to be brave, right? They equate, um, equate that to, I need to become immune to my stupid emotions, especially the negative ones, right? So you tell yourself, or maybe you tell other people to suck it up, right? No big deal. But that's not what it's about. You're missing all the insights. Emotional intelligence is about taking in these really important emotions, good and bad, that we're experiencing and generate incredible insights. And it helps us understand what we need, right? And what we value. I'm going to share with you my personal story, but I really want to hammer this in, right? Emotional intelligence is actually about not allowing feelings to get in the way. It enables you to stay alert, stay aware of how you're feeling, proactively monitoring that, and really take action to prevent unproductive or self-destructive emotions that might drive us to make irresponsible decisions, or maybe decisions that sound good in the short term, but you know tomorrow you're going to regret it, right? Or hurtful actions, right, that we might hurt other people's feelings, right? and then we regret it. And then you have to go through this whole process of apologizing or not apologizing, you know, the, the whole cycle. So why like save yourself from, from that painful experience, right? And honestly, if you ignore it sooner or later, your emotions gonna catch up to you, right? And you're gonna have a really hard time moving forward because guess what? You are dragged down by loads of emotional baggage right? That are unaddressed. Um, you're going to end up snapping at someone you love because you have all this load of stress and baggage, right? And it's really hard to focus on something. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like if you have a breakup, a big fight with somebody, you want to concentrate on academics, try it. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort, right? So decoding your emotion, knowing what it's trying to tell you and doing something about it is the key. So how did I like use emotional intelligence to get unstuck in my life? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to confess to you a quirk that I have, my personal flaw that I honestly had dwelled on for most part of my life, my insecurity. Um, so I was raised by my grandparents between five and 10. Um, this was in China, a tier two city. Um, and I didn't, my, I didn't even see my parents. And so we had a lack of resources. I didn't go out much because, or, you know, because my, my grandparents were older, right? So I didn't get exposed to like sports, outdoors, or like just physical activities. And because of that, I, um, <laughs> I thought of myself as athletically challenged. And like, I'm not, I'm not like joking. Um, and because of my lack of exposure and sort of this mindset, I, um, you know, I avoided physical activities. I thought I was horrible in school. And, you know, truth be told, you know, we are, we are what we um, are brought up as, right? We get these messages from people. And so the one of the message I was getting from people, from my grandparents and now then passed down to my parents and now to myself was that, you know, I may be good at academics, but I'm horrible at sports, horrible at PE. So that became my mental barrier. And guess what? Like I avoided PE classes like the plague. So I was like an art class. I somehow, even at elementary school, got like these permission slips to skip PE so that I can just work on my art, you know, for that whatever competition. <laughs> and then when, even in high school, when I was in the orchestra, I was like, oh, I need to practice some more for the concert. And somehow I got my permission slip again to skip PE. And you know what, like the only C I got in K-12 
was in PE. <laughs> and it was because I skipped so many classes that I just so happened to make a class that had a test on uh, how to how to like um, hit tennis balls against the wall, like at least 10 valleys. And I like just failed miserably. <laughs> Um, so, so this, this was the message I was just like kept on telling myself over and over again, right? And I had such a low self-esteem, right? And it wasn't until I went out for college, I, I sort of got away from this ball of messages that had been surrounding me to like this athletically challenged person. And what one of the entry week, entryway that got me to recognize, hey, you know, maybe I shouldn't take what I tell myself where other people tell me for granted. I need to just discover and do something about it, right? Instead of dwelling on, oh my God, I this sucks, you know, I suck kind of thing, right? So my entryway was actually snowboarding. And something about snowboarding, for those of you scared snowboarders, you know how it is. Like, People can tell you what to do, but at the end of the day, you got to get your butt on that mountain and snowboard down. And there's no way that you can read a manual and know how to do it, right? And that kind of freed me into really just relying on myself, on my own interpretation, understanding, really under, you know, just think like, what do I need to do instead of I'm not good enough, right? Um, and so, you know, it's just so funny, like even the first time snowboarding, I actually didn't know what waterproof pants were. So you can imagine how miserable I was and how my, miserable my butts were. <laughs> um, but something about it stuck with me. I realized I, I can rely on myself. I was figuring something out. And so I started snowboarding more and more, loved road trips, started doing that. And I realized I was getting pretty good at it. I was doing trips on it, right? And so that gave me a boost of confidence. And then what continued was I got a job, we were doing a marathon training team for my work. My friends, uh, co workers were like, you know, let's sign up for the marathon. And I was like, can I just do the half? Like, can, can I do it? I don't know if I can. But luckily, they encouraged me, I ran, you know, tons of marathons and half marathons following and then triathlons. And this really enabled me to take that leap of faith to really rely on new thoughts, relearning, rewiring what I have been telling myself. And, you know, um, I, I have like so many examples to this, right? But I, I think one thing when we talk about purpose, when we talk about inspiration is that we get intimidated to pursue something because it sounds as silly as this, right? It's not really a job, a career, right? But, you know, it's crazy what it can become. So I, my first job was a management consultant at Deloitte. It was a very cushy job. It, it enabled me to travel all over the nation and internationally. I got incredible jobs, well paid. But I had this tugging feeling that I needed something else, that I really wanted to start helping others in overcoming this mental barrier, especially from the physical aspect. Um, so, so I ended up leaving my job. And I became a personal fitness trainer <laughs> at a 24 hour fitness ultra sport. And, you know, I'm Chinese American. And so you can imagine like the stuff that my parents would say, right? My dad, super old school, would be like, you did what? <laughs> you want to be what? <laughs> and, you know, like there were a lot of mental like mindsets I had to overcome, right? But I took this leap of faith, right? Why not, right? I thought about going to grad school. So I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll also apply for grad school, but I had like nothing lined up. Um, so I ended up trading my high heels into tennis shoes being the fitness trainer. But you know what? I learned so much, so much, you know, never ever un underestimate the jobs that others do. If you feel it, you understand, you like it, you're curious about it, do it, just do it. And let me tell you, like, I learned so much about people, relationship skills, right? So what do you do as a fitness trainer when an older person says, I want to get ripped, I want to get fit. But then they, she then tells you, well, I don't like sweating. I, I don't want to sweat. <laughs> You're like, okay. Or what do you do when, you know, you had somebody in downward dog position and then they farted right next to you. <laughs> 
So how do you diffuse these situations? How do you use your sense of humor? How do you sell and persuade people, right? You can learn and do so much in whatever that you do if you put your mind to it. And so that's what I did for a while. And it turns out that I also, my old client at Deloitte ended up just missing me so much that they used me as an independent contractor with Deloitte's permission. So I ended up getting paid with the same hourly rate that I was charging as part of Deloitte. Um, and one last thing is, um, uh, I was applying to grad school and you know, you have to get ready for interviews. I think some of you are starting to think about that, right, applications. And interestingly, when I went in for my interview, I was expecting to be, you know, very professional, talking about the academics, your career aspirations, right? And what ended up happening is, we started connecting at this personal level on our passions, on what really moves us. And it turned out that the, the alumni interviewer actually worked at Crunch Fitness and was a body lifter, aside from the Google job, you know. And so we connected at that point. And that's where you really can build that relationship and that human connection and to enable people to truly understand who you are. So my point is that purpose is not as grand as you think, as people preach. And having a purpose doesn't mean that you have to be good at it. And whatever purpose you have is not silly, okay? So let's use this as an example. I'm gonna share my screen again. We're gonna do another card. Again, this is recorded. So if you wanna think some more, feel free to come back to it. But this card is Celebrate Imperfection. Honestly, I think perfection is overrated. Um, when I work with students as, a, you know, for my class, um, I was also a career coach, HR manager for hiring and worked as an executive coach in the Silicon Valley area with the top leaders. And honestly, I'm constantly surprised by just how imperfect or abnormal that people think that they are. They put themselves down because they want to be perfect. They want to appear perfect, look perfect, do perfect things, right? But what we don't realize is how abnormally normal we are. And the chances are, whatever you're struggling with right now, there's other people around you in this world that share the same struggles, okay? So instead of burying it, ignoring it, hiding it, suppressing it, own it right? Do something about it, vocalize it. So this card is really about celebrating that, right? So think of a quirk that you may have, or really a personal struggle or a flaw that you're dealing with. It shouldn't take long. It should just, you know, come to you. And it might even be connected to the, the stuck memory that you have. And really, I want you to document that and think about how you can turn it and to something that spreads inspiration. And I'm gonna share with you my story and how I did that. But let's just take a quick 30 seconds. Okay. So feel free to take a screenshot of this. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm gonna go on to my story so you can revisit back. Um, so here's my journey, um, how I channeled my emotions and other struggles, um, including the struggle I mentioned to you and to really finding my purpose and pursuing it. Um, and this is through the founding of my startup. Mind Brain Parenting and Mind Brain Emotion, which is now um, from startup, now a very successful company that not only benefits society, but at the same time makes a pretty good, darn good living for myself beyond what a partner at a consultancy makes. So, how did I come about to this, right? Um, so, what you see here is my first deck of cards. So, these are how do I describe this? Okay. So I'm gonna start from the beginning. Uh, as a first generation, the first person to graduate from a four-year college in all of my families, um, I've also had the privilege of attending Carter University for the Graduate School of Education. And when I was there, it was just an incredible time, right? Being, having this access to 
world-class research um, professors, peers, incredibly passionate and seasoned peers. And I was just kind of, um, I was, I was um, really amazed, but at the same time, I felt kind of guilty because why me, you know? Um, I have this privilege, but I know there are so many people just like me, just as accomplished, if not more, who don't have access to this. So my mission became really to ask this question of how can I distill that amazing wisdom, research, and golden nuggets of information and really disseminate them accessibly outside of the ivory tower? And at the same time, I was a parent attending, I was non-traditional as a parent attending Harvard. And so as a new parent, I also, you know, struggled and thought about like, how do I give my children the best, ensuring them the best chance of success in life? Um, I didn't have much of a role model, right? So I didn't know what to do. And that's also because I went to education to learn more. <laughs> um, and at the same time, I had a really good friend who was um, diagnosed with cancer. And so it really hits me into thinking, well, you know, when it comes down to it, what are some of the life's wisdom that I can leave with my children? And God forbid something happens to me, right? Rest in peace, knowing that they're set for life. What can I leave with my children? Um, and at the same time, one last thing I was dealing with was understanding and really looking at systemic oppression, the implicit biases that different social classes carry with them. And I realized, you know, these are the conversations to be had, but yet people don't have these conversations because one, they're not aware, and two, if they are aware, they're incredibly intimidated by them because they feel like they don't have the language, the skills, or the confidence, the appropriateness to be able to talk about them. So these things really inspire me to create what you see on the screen, which is the 52 Essential Conversations. Um, it's a sort of social emotional building games to enable people to have real, authentic, deeper conversations than the surface level of, you know, hey, how are you doing? What do you do? How was your day? You know, that kind of thing that gets you nowhere, right? But it does it in such a non-threatening way that everybody really not only gets to know themselves, but also each other. So somehow I, it was part of a class project and somehow it really, really um, got successful. Harvard picked it up and featured it on its homepage. I was on the Harvard Gazette and I, you know, crowdsourced funded it through Kickstarter and lo and behold, it was in 50 countries and just really, really good reputation. And even before coming here to UCI, they did a, a news um, to, you know, showcase my cards. And so I was, I was incredibly honored, but then honestly, I was like, oh my God, like this puts a lot of pressure on me. I don't want to be that one time wonder, <laughs> you know, like, uh, what am I going to do now? You know, so you definitely have these imposter syndromes that you talk to yourself about, right? So these are the times where really it makes or breaks what you decide to do next. So the next one. Here at UCI, I've launched my second deck of cards. And again, this is really channeling my own struggles. Um, so I was having some friendship issues at the time. A really good friend did something that was incredibly hurtful that you know no good friend should ever do to you. And it left me feeling very hurt. Um, again, as a parent, as a spouse, you know, being a new parent is incredibly stressful. I have three children and two of them are twins and they're preemies. So it was also about achieving um, sort of uh, love relationship understanding, right? How can we truly support each other? Especially when we get so stressed out and burned out, right? But being parents. Um, and the last thing is um, also, again, the systemic oppression. Um, I realized that um, some of the kids, especially from underrepresented, <clears throat> um, places, they don't have access to mentors. And even if they do, they kind of don't know how to ask for help. 
or honestly, like all of us, I feel like could be better in knowing how to ask for help and ask more for help. So I wanted to create some resources, easy to use anytime, anywhere, accessible tools for people to be able to know how to ask for help and to get that mentor that they need, get that role model that they've been aching at for. And so then I created the 52 essential relationships and I was holding my breath. I was like, do people, will people like it? Right. Um, and luckily I was invited to a TEDx talk to talk about my experience. And the bottom was UC Berkeley conference to this company. Um, so I just want to share with you, these all came from my own struggles, right? And the last one is coping skills, which is my late launch. And this was really <laughs> what happened during the pandemic. Um, it was it was really stemmed from uh, the need to cope, right? When we were dealing with all these issues, uncertainty, and I needed a way, exercises in real practical ways on a daily basis and how I can cope with my emotions, whether it's negative and um, positive, right? I was, again, mom of three, I was teaching, going to school and all that stuff, right? And it's also inspired by the course that I taught and just hearing from so many students and needing strategies, right? Ways to make healthy decisions instead of, you know, distracting or numbing themselves um, through recreational drugs or other just really unhealthy ways. So created this and, you know, thankfully um, the UCI Bill Applied Innovation um, recently featured me this year um, for this deck of cards and, you know, through other ways. And, and interestingly, this deck of cards is now become the bestseller. And that just kind of, you know, says I'm not a one-time wonder, right? So I, because I kept going, because I kept channeling into my own struggles, my own needs, right? Um, that I was able to do this. So what I really want you to take away from this is that purpose, purpose is really at the intersection of helping yourselves while helping others and helping yourselves to help others, right? Find something that makes you become a better person. And I can bet you that once you do that, it, it becomes a lot more clear to you how you can help others to become better people as well. So let's do another exercise. Um, and this one, well, oh, uh, sorry, and this is, um, my class, we're doing exercises on Zoom, thanks to the pandemic, right? <laughs> so this is what we're doing right now. Um, so here's the other exercise. And the exercise is called your inner compass. So when we talk about resilience, right? If I think if you have a source of inspiration that really is from within, right, your own purpose, it will lead you to persistence. It will lead you to resilience, especially when things get tough. And some of you have mentioned feeling lost, right? Um, this I hear over and over again, feeling lost, feeling unmotivated, right? You need that structure and remote learning has been really tough, right? But make your own structure. Make something that will want you to wake up first thing in the morning and get to work and do that thing you know, that you're passionate about. Um, one of the exercises I do in class is really to self-assess and understand the emotions you experience throughout the day. We have these emotional journals, but one interesting thing that I was surprised by is just how many times I see students describe how they're feeling as sluggish, especially even in this case that you've had an amazing night of sleep, you got enough hours of sleep, but you wake up feeling sluggish, maybe feeling absent, right? Those are the things with purpose can help you um, conquer. So I want you to take a few moments. You don't have to answer all these questions. Again, take a screenshot, you know, do what you need to do, but just think like what brings you joy? And if you have heard my 
examples. Joy doesn't have to be anything grand. Little things are perfectly good. What makes you feel alive? What brings you joy? What do you value about life, right? So if you feel lonely, then maybe you value human connections, right? Maybe you value true authentic conversations and relationships, right? Tap into those negative emotions because they really tell you what is it that you need the most that you're not getting and what is it that you value in life, which becomes your purpose. So just take a few moments. This is really important, right? So think about the top three questions. What brings your joy? When do you feel alive? If you don't know what brings your joy, think back to the memories of when you felt so alive, that thrill, right? And then overall big picture, what do you value about life? These are really tough questions. Um, don't worry about the last one, which is how can your work help others to feel this way? But you know what? That's definitely a homework. Um, and it can be just micro things, you know, do something that you feel like you need the most and do that for somebody else and see what happens, right? Okay, so I do wanna save some time for questions as well. But I have one last exercise in case if um, you're not sure um, or when things get tough, right? When things get tough, what do you do? Um, a lot of the times, you know, I just participated actually in a graduate division um, panel, I think a couple of weeks ago. It was with the graduate division here at UCI, um, the audience were PhD students, postdocs, and it was really around PhDs and entrepreneurship, right? How can you um, overcome some of the barriers and sort of get um, success in many different ways, not just, you know, the traditional path. And one particular student had asked me about um, getting mentors. And the way he phrased the question was, you know, how, how do you, what's your advice in getting mentors? Um, because, you know, like getting that someone to really be able to uplift me. And, you know, something about it, right? I was very candid and I said, you know, I, I answered it, but I have to say, you know, I told him, I said, you are the only one who can uplift yourself, right? Um, we often think of mentors as someone who's know-it-all, right? Who, who knows what's going on, who has years of experience, you know, I'm just going to share, uh, stop sharing because I want to see you, who has these years of experience, right, who supposedly knows the answer, been through it all, right, but that's not true. And we somehow think that mentors are the unicorn that's going to save us from our mystery or lack of purpose, that they'll tell us what to do and it will just become all clear. But you have to do the homework. That's what I told that person. And you have to be your own role model, your own mentor. It has to come from the inside. I mean, sure, I've had amazing mentors, mentors in my life, right? who is there to egg me on, to cheer me on. But you know what? When things are the darkest and the toughest, they are not there. It's you that is with, you, with yourself. You are responsible of uplifting yourself. And let me give you a secret about mentors. So a lot of people become mentors because they wanna be in the action. They wanna be a part of the action. And sometimes it's really hard, right, to make a move to be the action that takes work, right? But they can live vicariously through their mentees, right, to be a part of the action, um, to not quite have your skins in the game, but get that excitement. And that's what a lot of the mentors become mentors for that reason. And it, it really, again, it also, you know, honestly, it makes you feel good to help others. But my point is, you are responsible of uplifting yourself. No one is going to be there with you at all times. And most likely they're gonna be there when you're the most successful. I can tell you that. At the darkest hour, 
you need to uplift yourself. So let me go ahead and share my screen for our last exercise before we can launch into some questions. Okay, and this is self-compassion, okay? Um, think about what do you need right now? And what do you long to hear from others? Say from that mentor, right? From your family. And I want you to turn it so that you can say these things to yourself at any point in time when you need it the most, when you want it the most, okay? So this is an exercise where you can write three well wishes to yourself by filling in the blank. It starts with may I. So for example, may I be here for myself unconditionally. So usually I have my three wishes, right? I, I want you to really think to yourself that those things, especially when things get tough. Don't look externally for support, for help. I mean, obviously you need to ask for help, right? But to motivate yourself, to find that purpose, to stay resilient, that also has to come from the inside. And by having sort of this, this chant in a way, it keeps you grounded. It keeps your eye on the ball, on the game, on your purpose. So instead of waiting around, hoping to hear something from others, and I know all of us have something like, if only this person said this to me, right? If only I can get this. We need those assurance, right? If only you can tell me my work was great, this project was great, my presentation was great, right? <laughs> you need that from yourself, right? And part of my reason of why I do a ton of public speaking is also my way of channeling myself, right? It takes a lot of work to self-reflect and be vulnerable and talk about your stories. And yet, you know, like here I am, just me, right? Exposed. You may be giving me the once over, you may be judging me, but you know what? If you have this incredible self-compassion, you are immune to that because you are here to protect yourself, right? So, um, this is our last exercise. These honestly are the things that I go back to and revisit over and over again. It's not like riding the bike. Once you figured it out, you write it down, you're like, oh, I'm good. You know, it doesn't work like that, right? So I'm, I encourage you to visit this often and frequently. And don't be shy about communicating and working through this with your friends, your family, other people, because I can tell you everyone needs some of that. Um, okay, so with that said, I, I will take questions. So feel free to type questions into the Q&A. Um, but I want to share with you some resources. So on my website, there's a couple of like fun assessments. Um, one is about just, I think, you know, in order to work on our skill sets, we need to know where we need to work on, right? So there's um, a couple of fun quizzes just to give you some um, baseline understanding of where you are in terms of each of your emotional intelligence competencies and how are you doing on coping? What are your default coping strategies, right? How you're functioning. Um, so feel free to do that. It's, it's free. It's online. Um, yeah, so that's the resource, mindbrainemotion.com. And then I also have mindbrainparenting.org. This is more around um, helping districts, um, schools, especially at the K-12 level, um, to, to, to help with their students. And so I have tons of podcasts and resources, interviews with Harvard um, seasoned, you know, educators and professors and things around that. So feel free to use it as a resource. And the last thing is Instagram. Like I'm not really big on social media, but I'm trying. So we have this Instagram handle where hopefully we'll be able to provide more resources and tips and real people doing real coping skills. So feel free to follow that if you find it helpful. Um, but at this point, I want to leave at least um, like five minutes-ish for questions. So feel free to type anything in. And Daisy, Alyssa, thank you so much for the shout out. I'm so glad you find this helpful. Um, yeah, if you don't have questions, feel free to just engage with me and chat, um, but I wanna make this your hour.
Oh, thank you, Herschel. Thank you, Jasmine. Ah, okay, yeah. I definitely, thank you, Teresa. I've definitely, yeah. Uh, it's it's everything you heard is really good for um, just coping and understanding emotions from a professional, academic, and personal side. And Teresa, I've definitely had um, student parents being a student parent myself. Right? Um, these are all connected. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christina and Jing. I, I hope you got some laugh <laughs> at my story. Oh, thank you, Leonard. I appreciate that. Oh, um, we, oh, okay. Um, so I am not sure when I'll be teaching this class here at UCI again. Um, however, I am going to launch an online class equivalent of the emotional intelligence. So if you do wanna stay up to date, um, go, go ahead and go to mindbrainemotion.com. And there is an area where you can stay up to date and get notified. Um, and it's gonna, be, it's gonna be fun. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> So yeah, stay with me uh, up to date. Yeah. And I'm here at ECI. So feel free to look me up, um, you know, email me if you have any questions. Let's see, let me go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, so I wanna make sure you get a little bit of break between now and the night. Oh, do I have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, Chloe asked, is there such a thing as too emotional when it comes to describing yourself and your goals? Um, too emotional, huh? Well, okay, so without getting into like the specific, the emotion, you definitely can categorize it by the intensity, which um, sci uh, researchers call arousal, right? But honestly, like too emotional just means you're super excited, right? Versus you're happy, you're delighted, you know? There's different levels. Um, but I think how you describe yourself and your goals to others will depend on the context in which you do so. If this is a job interview, then you know you you have to maybe contain it a little, speak professionally, and do it in ways that is sort of situationally appropriate. But honestly, like inside inside of myself, it's like a ball of fire. <laughs> um, there's I don't think um, if I'm understanding you right, um, own it right understand what you're experiencing. Um, we might have um, some self filters externally, but I want you to tap into your emotions, however intense they might be. Okay, um, I mentioned I'm a father, mother of three. How do you teach your emotions to go about their emotions? Is it a conversation you have regularly? Yes, 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 yes. I a regular basis. And this is honestly, they humble me, right? I, we're very rational people, but we'll, let me just tell you, when it comes to kids, they are not rational <laughs> and they are not predictable. <laughs> so it, it's definitely a huge challenge. And as I mentioned, this is not riding a bike, right? I'm, I'm not teaching them to ride a bike. So it takes day in, day out of reinforcement of patient conversations, of helping them to take perspectives, to tap into like, what they're experiencing, right? 
um, so, so yes, a conversation I have regularly, and that's why I created 52 Essential Conversations, because it's something that you use at the dinner tables, you use while you're in the car, while you're waiting for something, so there's no escaping from me, for my kids, it's everywhere. Um, how do I personally get away from ruminating emotions? Yes. There's some strategies. Actually, it's part of my course. Self-distancing -dis is a research-based strategy and really being able to distinguish between self-reflection and going borderline rumination. Um, but I think some of the exercises you've done will get you started. If you have more questions, um, I'm going to be posting more resources online about it. So I know we're running out of time, but there are, there, yeah, there are a lot of ways. I have my coping mechanisms as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, Ritu, do you wanna go ahead and transition? Yeah, definitely. Just thank you so much for taking your time. This is a great start to our conference. And thank you all of y'all for being so engaging with Jenny and just being so active in the chat. It really makes this virtual conference a little bit closer to what it would have been like in person. So just thank you, thank you so much. Um, so right now we are ending um, our first keynote and y'all have like a 10 minute break before we go ahead and begin our first um, workshop, workshop sessions for today. I'll go ahead and add our website to the chat right now. Um, so y'all can kind of go ahead and look and see what um, workshops we'll be having if y'all want to go ahead and attend them. And feel free to um, know that you don't have to pre-register. You can just go ahead and click the link on the website and you'll automatically go into the Zoom. So if anything like piques your interest, go ahead and jump into that call. Um, but thank you so much again, Jenny, and just the rest of y'all who attended. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and end the call. So just. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.